pleasure to be here. I'm uh, one of those uh, guys that have been uh, for a while in, in the sleep business. Uh, started in, uh, in the mid-90s, so uh, basically been observing uh, a lot of uh, technology, um, uh, technology advances that have happened and uh, really uh, progressed uh, sleep medicine and been uh, actively involved in, in many of, uh, of those uh, steps that, that uh, have happened in the past. Uh, so uh, I, I thought that it would be a good idea to uh, maybe go quickly over uh, the um, uh, technolo technology advances that have happened and have uh, uh, changed uh, the world of, of uh, sleep diagnosis. So, uh, well, this is uh, when I, I show this picture to, to people, they often ask me about was this in the 50s, but it's not, uh, not that. It's, uh, for me, it's not that long ago. <laughs> It was uh, basically the, the status uh, that was uh, in the sleep industry when uh, I started there. In, uh, so uh, we were just about uh, entering the digital age of, of sleep uh, and, and sleep diagnostics. Uh, we actually did a, a project uh, at the time when I started to connect uh, PC uh, computers to this type of amplifiers to change them from paper into digital recorders because uh, the new amplifiers were very expensive. Uh, people really wanted to uh, be able to, uh, to go uh, to use them uh, further. So, uh, so, so later, you know, that was uh, my first project was in the, in the mid 90s with the, uh, with the company called Plaga in Iceland uh, doing the Ampli 10 amplifiers and, uh, and later the, uh, the uh, N7000 and Amplettas. So, so this was the uh, uh, early 90s uh, when, uh, and what happened there was really uh, a, techni a technological uh, uh, a breakthrough, uh, first in the, uh, in, in the um, uh, electronics that we could actually start measuring those devices without having like a, you know, a diesel generator, uh, carrying a diesel generator around with us. Uh, and also uh, that uh, in signal processing and uh, the tape technology was integrated enough so that we could start uh, building those tiny, or, or not that tiny anymore, <laughs> tiny at the time devices that could be used for ambulatory and uh, in-lab uh, PhDs. Uh, on the right side, we, that, that this is the, the uh, device, the Amplata device that we, we did uh, in the uh, early 2000s. Uh, the, um, it was uh, a polygraph uh, device, uh, was thought to be revolutionary at that time. And that also uh, came as uh, um, was a consequence out of a a technological breakthrough in memory technology. So that was the, the big thing that we need so much electricity to drive the flash drives that uh, recorded the data, that it was impossible to uh, min miniaturize the devices more than we could before that, that uh, technological step was reached, that we could start uh, having compact plus type of, of, uh, of memories and uh, integrating the technology into something smaller. Um, the, uh, yeah, and this is uh, actually, you know, how, how things look, look, uh, looked like uh, back in those days, the N7000 in 2002, uh, you know, a big device in, in the hospital. Uh, but, uh, but then later, you know, in, uh, like uh, in 2006, uh, the Bluetooth technology uh, came along. And if you maybe, uh, some people think uh, that Bluetooth has been here forever, but it was basically first entered the market in 2003. Uh, and at that time, we were actually asked, uh, the engineering teams that I was working with then, that was asked to actually do a, like a smart sensor technology based uh, uh, project based on that technology. But, uh, so I went to, uh, to meet with uh, Sony Ericsson or Ericsson at the time and, and the guys that were providing this and they said, well, just hold, hold your horses, uh, even the big guys are struggling. <laughs> And uh, that was so true, it was so not ready for uh, being used in, uh, in this type of te technology. But uh, uh, already in 2006, uh, after we founded uh, uh, Knox Medical, uh, we actually uh, uh, did the uh, first uh, uh, Bluetooth uh, uh, sleep diagnostic device. Uh, and uh, actually it was quite a risky, risky thing at the time, so we're taking the components that were barely on the edge of being uh, capable of uh, providing uh, the uh, low energy needed to uh, 
be able to run this on a, on a sensible uh, size device and beat um, betting on uh, an oximeter uh, that was uh, just recently entered the market from, from Nonin. Uh, they were still struggling. It was big, big and bulky, but we really managed to uh, get that out in, in, uh, in 2009 and, uh, and uh, build this, uh, you know, well, this concept of body area network or BAN so that, uh, that you could stream the, uh, the data uh, between sensors uh, on, the, on the patient to try to reduce the, the bulk of wires that were basically uh, um, you know, uh, causing a lot of, of the, co the complications uh, linked to the polysomographies. Uh, then, uh, and uh, with this, uh, we, uh, we came, came to the market with a, a mobile app, you know, that was the, the big thing that you could have actually started with tablets because that was the only thing available, uh, but being able to uh, connect to the devices uh, and uh, control the devices over a mobile app was like a, uh, the really big thing. So, so you see that uh, we, I think, you know, on average, we are probably like two or three years after the uh, technology uh, uh, disruption uh, in the commercial market to, uh, to adapt to it in the medical market, but that's quite normal because of the uh, complications that it is, that it is re uh, related to, what, to doing that, to take it into the medical sector. Uh, so in 2018, uh, that was a big um, revolution on that uh, probably nobody noticed. The Bluetooth 5 technology came along. So the Bluetooth 5 is, you know, you th think about Bluetooth, I don't think that's just one thing, but it's actually, we are on the third generation of Bluetooth now that uh, uh, was revolutionized in, in 2018 with the, with the Bluetooth 5 technology. Uh, that uh, actually opened the possibility to stream a lot of uh, data with a very low power. So basically opening up for the wireless uh, technology where we wanted to see it in 2002 and then 2006, it was finally uh, possible to, do the, uh, to stream the, the uh, uh, data amount required for uh, preparing for smart sensor and online uh, te uh, technology in, uh, in uh, small and compact devices. So, so that was another thing that uh, revolutionized uh, 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 sleep, uh, at least to my uh, as, as, at least as I see it. Uh, and uh, and uh, in the same time as we, we get new technology, we try to implement it in the best way. How can we, what, what uh, well, we have to choose what problem are you resolving? Do you want more signals? Do you want, uh, is it uh, more uh, uh, accuracy that you want? Do you want to simplify things? Do you want the patient to feel more comfortable? So how are you going to uh, spend those new uh, technology that is now available, and, uh, and, and on the picture here we see the, uh, the uh, self-applied somnography, so in this case we, we decided to spend it on trying to uh, bring uh, uh, polysomnography to home in a way that could be applied by the, by the patient, and, uh, and uh, this is uh, something that has been used uh, quite a lot in, in research over the, res over the few past few years, but and, uh, is hopefully entering the uh, uh, clinical market soon. Uh, so, so we talked about, uh, you know, a few technology components, it's like uh, all electronics, 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 but then uh, one big thing is happening uh, that has uh, on top of everything else. So uh, just in the few recent years, we had uh, a huge uh, progress in using artificial intelligence. Um, I, I recall when I, I was uh, grad, uh, graduating, like uh, in, uh, in uh, well, very long time ago, in '92, uh, I, I did. I, I thought this was coming. The artificial intelligence is here, and uh, I did my my thesis on uh, artificial intelligence in industry, actually, and uh, thought, well, now computers are getting wise. They will, you know, they are coming to take us. But uh, well, here we are 20 years later, and, but uh, if it wouldn't have been for the big progress over the last few years, uh, uh, I would be standing here again and saying, well, nothing big has happened. But uh, what happened is that uh, we uh, now have uh, uh, captured the technology to be able to uh, do some real good with artificial intelligence, use it to <coughs> simplify uh, the work that we do, uh, use it to uh, more accurately and, uh, and more and more accurately actually uh, classify 
the regular uh, data that, that we are working with, like uh, sleep staging and arousal detection and, and the things related to uh, standard uh, uh, to, to, the, to standard uh, polysomnography or, or PTs, but also to dig into signals that we have been recording for years and, uh, and squeeze out of them information that we didn't even know that was in there. So one thing uh, as a, a, a CTO that I always uh, honored is that the signals have to be good. If you don't have a good signal, you don't have good anything. So no matter how much you process a bad signal, you won't uh, be able to get anything true out of it. So, uh, so we, have, uh, we were so lucky to very much focus on the signal quality in, or, in all our recordings or recorders. And that meant that we had a lot to work with when we, when we finally got the opportunity to de deploy artificial intelligence uh, on those signals that had been collected. So uh, one, of, uh, one of the, uh, um, I would say, results from uh, that type of work was uh, uh, the body sleep algorithm that we have uh, released uh, with our T3S devices in, uh, in uh, Europe. Uh, so this is like a, a artificial intelligent machine learned uh, <coughs> methodology. Uh, sorry about my voice. I'm, I'm a little bit uh, I got, got cold in, in Greece. I'm coming from Iceland. I don't know what happened. But the uh, but the uh, what what is the uh, uh, the thing with body sleep is really that uh, it uh, looks at uh, signals from the uh, respiratory belts and uh, transform them. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, much better. So, so what, what we, we have in the body sleep is like a machine learned algorithm to predict uh, sleep stages out of the respiratory belts. And actually, how, how can we do that? Uh, we know that there is information about sleep stages in the, uh, uh, in the respiratory belts because uh, the primary signal, uh, one of the primary signals, for example, to classify REM and non-REM sleep is basically the uh, uh, EMG submental. Uh, based on the uh, REM sleep paralysis, uh, and, uh, and what happens is that uh, that same REM sleep paralysis affects uh, also intercostal uh, muscles. So uh, you, you see a difference uh, in the relationship between the two belts, the abdominal thorax belt, when you enter, enter REM sleep compared with uh, non-REM sleep, for example. So, uh, so this has been there all the time. You know, why didn't we use it uh, earlier? And that's uh, it was really difficult before we had uh, access to uh, this type of uh, technology. So, uh, Jon is going to do the uh, good speech about uh, artificial intelligence. So I'm not going to stop there long, but just talk about the technology in general. That uh, that the disruptors that we have now in our hand <coughs> are really three. We have uh, the cloud uh, connection, so we have a, a, the capability to get uh, a lot of data into the cloud environment where we can process the data. Uh, we have the variable technology, and I'm not just talking about variable technology as like smart boxes, but the same technology is use, useful to uh, stream like high quality data as well. So the, the drivers of the variables technol technology they will disrupt the uh, sleep diagnostic technology as well. We, we just have to decide how we are deploying them. And then we have the artificial intelligence on top of it. And uh, I think the, the importance of the artificial intelligence is, is so much because it really means that uh, earlier you, you would say uh, a lot of data means a lot of work. Now a lot of data only means a lot of accuracy. So you can, if you have someone to process the data and present it to you, uh, more is more. So um, again, what should we do with this technology that we have now? Should we go for the simplicity? Should we do uh, like a, sm uh, a smart sensor that uh, detects sleep, go for the watches and uh, make a smart watch that tries to predict how you sleep? Or should we go for the high accuracy sleep studies? So should we use this technology to measure more and have more data on the patient and have, have more higher accuracy profiles, uh, sleep profiles and, and, uh, and, and uh, go into that direction. Because the, uh, uh, now we have, the, if the sensors are getting smaller and smaller and we can measure more and more and stream more and more data, why shouldn't we? So basically, you know, this is uh, uh, I would say the crossroads that we stand at, that half the industry is going for 
uh, appearing on the or betting on the uh, simplified sleep study. Or the other half is betting on high, uh, high accuracy sleep studies with uh, with uh, more integrated sensors, but uh, and more data. Um, so, how do we know what to measure, and how do uh, how do we know if the, what uh, the signals that we are actually measuring are uh, um, are, um, that we are measuring the right signals and uh, they uh, provide us with the accurate results. And uh, this is actually a, a question that has not uh, any good answer. Uh, we, we know of, if we look at the, uh, the um, photoplethysmography signal from the oximeters, uh, for example, we can uh, see there's a lot of influences to that signal from uh, different sleep stages, for example. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of uh, arousal uh, has a direct uh, influence on, uh, on the photoplethysmography signal. But is it really enough? Is it clear enough for are all the factors that are disturb disturbing it? Will it work for everyone? That's, a, that's really the big question. Uh, and, and there is no good way to say, take a signal and say uh, the signal contains this information or it doesn't contain it. It's no, there's no direct translation, uh, tra translation between the two. But luckily, we, we got the physiology and the earlier studies that tells us, for example, uh, how heart rate variability affects outco um, outcomes or, uh, or how, they, how, how those links are uh, being made. So, uh, so I tried to create like a map uh, for, for the discussion. How can we really uh, discuss uh, if, if, if there's a signal? Um, contain the information uh, that are required to get the result. And, uh, and basically, you, uh, there, uh, this, in this meter, it's like a, uh, if you have a, a narrow arrow, that might, means that uh, there's a weak link between the signal and the result. A weak link means that it is uh, the result is directly uh, affected, but, uh, but the connection is weak for some reason. For example, it can be influenced by many other factors, so it's a, a weak link. Uh, so the uh, if the if the uh, so the if the result is uh, so uh, so you have a, a you also you have like a, a direct relation and indirect relation. Direct relation would be like measuring EMG to to get uh, sleep stages, because EMG is used as a primary signal according to standard uh, for the reference that you are using. But measuring respiration and to predict the same thing is an indirect measure because we are predicting the the um, uh, result based on the on the uh, uh, on the signal. So are we doing a prediction or are we measuring basically? And is it strong or is it weak? So so we have those four arrows. And I just uh, for the uh, discussion uh, took uh, a few signals and uh, and tied them to. Uh, few uh, different uh, um, results of, uh, of, uh, of sleep medicine. And uh, if we go just quickly through them, we have the actigraph that is, that has like a, it is indirect because it's not measuring sleep, but it has uh, a, a, reason, a, reason, well, a reasonably uh, strong t uh, connection to sleep time, less with arousals. And I probably should have put uh, sleep profile in there, but it's like a, uh, in many cases very weak. We have the photoplethysmography that has a, a direct link, a direct and uh, relatively strong link to sleep apnea. Um, less on sleep time. Um, the photoplethysmography and the tip analysis are strong on, on uh, strong but indirect on arousals. And then you have a, a weaker link on sleep profiling. The path technology is similar, a very strong link to arousals, uh, less, uh, not used directly for, for sleep apnea detection, but uh, indirectly, uh, and so on. So if I, uh, the frontal EEGs, is the same as the, uh, uh, that we use for the SAS, or the same as the PSTs, they are direct and strong links to sleep time arousals and sleep profiles. Uh, we have the, the cannula that contains uh, uh, well, directly contributes to sleep apnea detection uh, by, by, uh, based on the, uh, the, uh, stan the standard, but it also contains information about arousals uh, of weak ones. We have the respiratory arousals and we have the, the recovery breaths and a lot of things that are happening in the cannula flow that can be used for that one. 
and a very weak link to the sleep profiling. So it's not good to use the cannula signal to do a sleep profiling. Uh, we have the, uh, the bioimpedance uh, signals for respiration that is being used by, uh, by some uh, players that uh, are used for the sleep apnea detection, but then again have, uh, have uh, well, uh, contribute uh, as the cannula to ourselves and sleep profiling. And then uh, we have the two uh, rip belts that we are very fond of, as you hear, as you hear and use it for uh, the body sleep uh, 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 classification, for example. That has like a strong link to, to sleep apnea. It, it uh, has obviously um, the uh, contains the rip flow signal. It contains the uh, the uh, classification of the information for the for the standard classification of of apneas into central and uh, and obstructive and and those parts. Uh, but then again, it's like a very information rich signal. But it also contains like a strong link on the sleep profile because it is also measuring uh, the uh, REM sleep paralysis from the test movement compared to the abdomen movement, as is like a, and this physiological connection is known between the, well, well, the uh, muscular system on, the, on your uh, tin and, and uh, on, the, on the chest. Um, but, the, but the nice thing is that, or nice thing, I don't know, it gets more and more complicated, I guess. If you, if you, now I turned on the, the signals that we are recording, for example, in the polysomography or the SAS studies, and then we see that we have quite a lot of, of information density, if you like, on the right side uh, for sleep apnea, sleep time, arousal, and sleep profile. So this is like the polysomography, so no wonder that it's direct. But then again, there's a lot of uh, indirect uh, information there that we are not using at all. We have uh, those, like for example, those strong, strong indirect signals from the uh, two rip belts that are contributing to the sleep profiling, but we are not using them in, in standard polysomography, but the information are there for us to use if we like to. Um, if we look at the, uh, or on uh, the polygraph study, we have strong direct signals uh, for uh, the uh, um, for the apnea uh, detection, uh, but and we have uh, well a relatively strong indirect signal for the sleep profiling, but then less for the arousal and, and the, the, the sleep time. Uh, but uh, but there's a lot of signals that are contributing to it. So if we can combine those information, we can get uh, more and more accurate results. If we take just like a, a watch or actigraph with a photoplethysmography. We have, uh, uh, well, we have one of the direct signals for sleep apnea, we, we, uh, we, and uh, we have the, oxy the oxygenation. We are lacking the, uh, we are lacking the uh, flow for uh, being co uh, comparable to polysomography, so the uh, rest is guesswork uh, on the sleep profile ourselves and sleep time. So uh, this might be one way to really try to present what signals are needed to get to a certain result. So, um, uh, well, based on, on this, uh, maybe no wonder that uh, the uh, technology vision of, of NOx is uh, maybe summarized in that we, we think that we should go for the more information type of, of studies. Uh, we, we have this phrase, more complete while less complex. That's like our mantra in the engineering team. How can we deliver more signals, but with less, less complexity and more economical scalability? And, uh, and uh, the, uh, well, the, uh, so uh, we believe that the smaller and more ergonomic sensors uh, that are available today will uh, become available. So it will be no problem to collect more signals. Uh, we are betting on the cloud and artificial intelligence. And uh, really, you know, uh, the artificial intelligence part is so important because that means that all this data is not like going to cost all the budget that everyone has. So just uh, in the end, uh, this is maybe how we visualize the, the uh, clinical pathway for, uh, for uh, sleep, uh, that where we, where we have the, those steps of the engagement, the assessment, the scoring, the interpretation, and the care uh, deployment, that we will be uh, using artificial, uh, artificial intelligence in all steps or providing technology to do so. Uh, by getting uh, the data into the cloud uh, and then uh, providing artificial intelligence to help people to, to use that data. Uh, we are basically focusing, focusing more and more, uh, or most of our effort on the scoring part, but then again, uh, the uh, interpretation part, for example, 
is, uh, has a lot of potential uh, for use of artificial intelligence to really use a broader scope of data to do that. And maybe that's, uh, that's actually uh, the model in this picture is, is uh, one of uh, my co-founders of, of uh, Knox Medical, <laughs> that, uh, the mechanical designer and the model. So uh, he's, uh, he's um, sl sleeping there uh, in his future uh, concept design of uh, how, uh, how a complete uh, sleep uh, study should look like uh, with the EGs, with the rip belts and with the wireless sensors, but in a format that is really not uh, disturbing us. So that was the end of mine.